It is my pleasure to welcome you today to our webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma. We explore different topics each month with nationally respected experts who speak to you about timely issues and concerns. Please plan to join us each month. This is Sally Schessler, the Network's Director of Education. Today we welcome two doctors from the University of Wisconsin. First, Dr. Robert Lemansky is a professor of pediatrics and medicine in the Division of Pediatric Allergy, Immunology, and Rheumatology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in Madison, Wisconsin. He is the current Associate Dean for Clinical and Translational Research at UW. He is the past director of the Morris Institute for Respiratory Research at the University. He received his degree in medicine from the University of Wisconsin Medical School and his pediatric residency training at the University of Wisconsin Hospitals. His allergy and immunology training was performed both at the University of Wisconsin and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Bethesda, Maryland. He is board certified in both pediatrics and allergy and immunology. He was the 2015-16 president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and his basic, clinical, his basic and clinical research has focused on the pathophysiology and treatment of asthma, particularly during early childhood. We also welcome Dr. Sujini Kakamanu. Dr. Kakamanu is a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has received funding from the Office of the National Coordinator to study the use of electronic medical records to improve communications with schools and has served as a workforce group leader and creator of the online toolkit for SAMPRO, the school-based asthma management program initiative that was released in 2016. And that's the program we're excited to listen to uh, uh, you speak to us about today. So Dr. Lemansky and Dr. Kakamanu, thank you for being here and we're eager to hear what you have to share with us. If, if you if you put your, your cursor right on the PowerPoint and then try that, sometimes the control panel can throw you off a little bit. Okay, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to present this afternoon my presidential initiative, um, which we have termed the School-Based Asthma Management Program, or SAMPRO. And I'm going to begin uh, to give you the background about how this program was developed, and then I'm going to turn this over to my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kakumanu, who will provide you with some additional details, particularly the development of the website that um, really gives you all the information that's important regarding this program. To get us all on the same page, um, to basically introduce the burden of asthma in schools, despite significant research advances, childhood asthma morbidity is high. It affects about 6.8 million children, which is close to 10% overall. And importantly, children with asthma miss three times as much school as healthy children. And over time, these missed school absences create a cycle of reduced academic achievement, which our program is hopefully designed to um, uh, reduce uh, significantly and improve the education of our children with asthma. Now, there are gaps in school asthma care coordination in many communities, and this is reflected by a lack of communication among families, clinicians, and school nurses that results in, first, children not having needed access to medications such as rescue asthma inhalers in school. School nurses are often unaware of the asthma management plan that's been developed by the healthcare provider. And within the school environment and also the home, students continue to be exposed to triggers that influence their control of uh, their asthma. Now, as I mentioned to you at the outset, um, when I was president of the American Academy of Allergy and Asthma and Immunology in 2015 and 2016, my major presidential initiative was to create a school-based asthma and now an allergy uh, management program, which we have termed SAMPRO. It's important to recognize at the outset that this was sponsored by the Academy but also received significant financial um, um, 
input from the National Association of School Nurses. Now, the uh, figure that appears on the left of your slide is basically our mantra for SAMPRO, and it reflects what we have termed the circle of support, which includes the child in the middle, the clinician who transmits information after evaluating the child to the school personnel and hopefully to the school nurse, the family, a very important component of the circle of support, and how the communication needs to occur between the clinician, the family, and the school nurse and the family, and then the support within the community in terms of how it helps to keep this circle of support intact and communication going on an ongoing basis. Now, in order for us to put this together, we, um, the Academy and the National Association of School Nurses sponsored what we have termed a summit, which occurred in October of 2015 in Washington, D.C. And this is a picture of all the wonderful people who participated in the summit. And I was able to attract a number of different people who were stakeholders who either had um, an active asthma management program within schools or were experts in trying to develop um, these asthma management programs uh, within schools and wanted to share their expertise with the group. Now, just to give you a healthy um, uh, appreciation of all the different groups that, that participated in this summit, it was very ex extensive and included um, nurse practitioners, um, family medicine, pediatrics, um, school nurses, different societies that deal with asthma, including the American Lung Association, the American Thoracic Society, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the American Academy, of course, and a number of different groups that, as I mentioned previously, had school-based asthma management programs, either established in the past or um, um, had ongoing programs that dealt with this particular area. Now, after the summit, um, the group began to work on creating a white paper that describes um, SAMPRO in uh, detail. And I'm very happy to report that this uh, white paper was accepted for publication and published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in September of 2016. The reference for this particular publication is um, here. And if you have a pencil and paper, it might be worth a while taking down and referring to it when the webinar is finished. It's also on uh, the website, so if you didn't get a chance to write down uh, the reference, it was available on our website here, which should be very accessible, and uh, Sujini will be talking about this um, during her presentation. Now, what are the components of SAMPRO? We felt, the group felt that there were four components that we really wanted to focus on. The first one is establishing this uh, circle of support that I showed you the picture of uh, previously that facilitates communication among clinicians, school nurses, families, and the community. The second was to create standard asthma management plans, and these consist of two different types. The first is an asthma emergency treatment plan, and this is a plan for all students with asthma, which would include hopefully stock albuterol within the school and a, and a uh, method of delivery at the time of the asthma episode. Now, this is a generic plan, which means it would fit all individual students if they came in with uh, trouble with their asthma. The second is a more individualized plan, which, as we all probably know, has been termed an asthma action plan. And we wanted to create this for use both at home and in school. And the input we received from a variety of different sources um, stated that they wanted to include um, some authorizations for self-carry administration of asthma medications at school and a parental release of information so that we could really facilitate this circle of support between these, um, um, these different groups or different individuals who comprise the circle of support. We also developed a comprehensive education plan for all school personnel, and Sujini will go over what exactly that means. And finally, assessing the school environment. 
and uh, remediating um, of any school-based asthma triggers. Well, let's look at these just a little bit more in detail. First, component one, establishing the circle of support. Again, uh, this is the mantra for SAMPRO, as depicted in this slide and in the one I showed you previously. And in order to establish this um, circle of support, it's important that each member of the circle is integral to the care team. So they all have to be uh, recognized as playing an equal role in the management of the child with asthma. Communication within the circle of support is absolutely crucial to ensure that the asthma action plan is followed both at home and at school. As you will see, SAMPRO recommends that each school employs a full-time registered school nurse. It also provides checklists for each member of the circle of support. And as Sujani will go over with you, these checklists are available for downloading on the SAMP in the SAMPRO toolkit, which is available on the web. What about component two, developing asthma uh, management plans? We felt it was important to as best as possible to create a standardized action, asthma action plan in order to allow it to provide uh, or, or to become a concise document that would coordinate asthma care. We also wanted to create an asthma emergency plan in order to empower schools to provide urgent asthma care for students with severe symptoms who may not have on file an asthma action plan. Third, um, to, be, to be more individualized for students who have known asthma, we created an asthma action plan that is again standardized um, with regards to the language and the people who we felt were important to be able to have access to it and to sign off on it um, on hopefully a regular basis. And we also felt that these asthma management plans would facilitate the conversation to coordinate asthma care uh, resources across the healthcare continuum. Now the SAMPRO asthma action plan, um, the group felt that it was important to put some key features within this plan. And these key features include first, a statement about the asthma severity of the child, Second, the potential for risk of exacerbations. Third, the asthma medications that should or could be given at school. The triggering factors that were known for each individual child. To um, provide orders or guidance for the prophylactic overall use or administration at school. And then as I'll show you the authorizations that many of the stakeholders felt at least in their communities, were important in order for the asthma action plan to be executed. And finally, for users who prefer to use their own asthma action plan, and I'm sure there are many of you who are on the webinar that have your own um, systems in place within your community, but we felt it was important to create a supplementary school treatment form that's available in the toolkit that would bring it up to the standard level that we have for the asthma action plan that is part of SAMPRO. Now this is what the asthma action plan for home and school uh, looks like. It contains a number of components that um, you may have seen previously, um, but also just to emphasize again, there's a place to indicate asthma severity, a place to indicate the risk of um, future exacerbations, how to use prophylactic albuterol, and then of course the um, different zones, the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone, and basically guidance as to what to do as various um, symptoms uh, develop and the child uh, presents him or herself to the school personnel. Now this is the bottom of the asthma action plan. We didn't have room to put this all on one slide, but here's the asthma triggers that are being listed, the self-carry and self-administer um, uh, portion for the school staff, um, the uh, place for the asthma provider to provide their signature, um, also the parent and the guardian, a place for them to sign. And in many schools, it's a requirement that the school nurse sign off on the asthma action plan, indicating that he or she understands the, the guidance that they are being given 
for each individual child. Now, this is the school supplementary treatment order portion of um, the asthma action plan. And you can see that it's abbreviated from um, what I showed you on the previous two slides. And again, this is was created for people who probably already have an asthma action plan available. They like using their own, but this is a supplement to be able to hopefully cover what the group felt uh, needed to be covered in terms of a comprehensive approach to developing an asthma action plan for schools. And again, this is just another part of it and uh, the triggering factors, the severity, the sign off portion, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's just to serve as a supplement to um, different asthma action plans that may be available to you um, within your district or within your community. Well, what about component three, comprehensive asthma education? What we've done is we've created again a toolkit which contains many links and resources for many validated programs. We felt that asthma education is needed for all members of the circle of support and that asthma education should address health uh, literacy and multicultural beliefs. And these are just a few of the examples that are included on the website. The um, Open Airways program for schools has been put out by the American Lung Association. It's been out there for a number of years. The audience for this is children 8 to 11 years of age. It's a rather lengthy program consisting of six 40-minute group sessions. Um, it is an interactive approach to asthma self-management education. It covers warning signs, trigger avoidance, and decision-making skills. And it uses methods of storytelling games and uh, role playing in order to get the message across. Iggy and the Inhalers is a program that was developed by a pediatric allergist that I helped uh, to mentor here at the University of Wisconsin along with his wife, Amy. Um, they are currently in practice in the Chicago area. And um, Alex is a very, very good um, cartoonist, and he's made a number of cartoon characters um, that really help to teach children in terms of the types of medications that are available, how they work, when they should be used, et cetera, et cetera. My colleague, Kathleen Chanovich, who's a pediatric nurse practitioner, and her colleagues in the Madison Metropolitan School District actually did some work to validate this particular tool. It's a 30-minute session. Again, it contains animated videos, comic books, stickers, and trading cards. And what they found is that it increased asthma knowledge at a one-month uh, follow-up. And again, the target, organ, uh, target audience is third to fifth grade um, students. There is a small fee per student set, but it's um, free in English and uh, Spanish uh, PDFs and it's available at this particular website. Well, I guess I clicked on the website by mistake, so it works. So component four is an assessment and remediation of environmental asthma triggers. And um, just to set the stage, indoor air quality and exposure to asthma triggers can affect both children and school staff. Schools can reduce asthma triggers and improve asthma quality through the use of indoor air quality management programs. And these interventions are most successful when school staff such as janitors, bus drivers, and school administrators and teachers are all involved in the process. Now the indoor quality or IAQ tool for schools uh, has been developed um, through the Environmental Protection Agency and Importantly, 34% of schools nationwide use this particular tool. And this particular site also includes a school IEQ assessment mobile app, best practices, a sample IAQ management plan, and online education. So I would encourage you, if you haven't seen this, to go to this particular web website. It's very informative and can be very helpful to you. Within Wisconsin, we have the Wisconsin Asthma Coalition, and they have developed a school walkthrough program, which you can also learn more about by going to this website. And this has been developed in partnership by the Wisconsin Asthma Coalition, the Green and Healthy Schools, 
and e-school care, which has been developed here at the University of Wisconsin. It helps users identify common asthma triggers and provides low to no cost solution. And importantly, it empowers schools to identify a staff champion to participate, including school nurses and janitors. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, um, Dr. Kakumanu, who is going to review with you the Sampro Toolkit and finding the resources that work for you. Thank you, Rob. As Rob mentioned, I'm gonna spend my time talking about the Sampro Toolkit. The Sampro workforce has been diligent about putting forth evidence-based recommendations for coordinating pediatric asthma care throughout their circle of support. A key factor in maintaining sustainability of Sampro will require implementation within individual communities. The Sampro Toolkit available on the Quad AI website is a free online resource that provides tools to facilitate this goal. The Sampro Toolkit was developed by the Sampro workforce in collaboration with the University of Wisconsin Health Innovations or HIP Exchange program. The toolkit is available for free download to any internet user after a simple registration process. The registration will require entering some brief demographic information, and I will walk you through that process today. And that information is really being used to track our program efficacy as well as dissemination efforts. Within the toolkit, you will be able to access additional resources that are not included in the white paper. And this includes electronic versions of the Asthma Action Plan, as well as a supplemental school treatment form in English and in Spanish that was shown previously in this talk. In addition, we have a number of online resources, including instructional videos and slide sets to help users educate themselves, their patients, as well as their communities about SAMPRO. In the next few slides, I will briefly walk you through accessing the toolkit through our web link shown on this slide and shown by Rob previously in this webinar. When you click on the Sampro link shown on the previous slide, it will take you to the, the Quad AI landing page as shown here. You will notice an open access link to the Sampro white paper we talked about earlier, as well as a list of endorsements and useful links uh, for our program. On the bottom of the landing page, you will see an embedded button to access the Sampro toolkit. Once you click on that button, it will direct you to the University of Wisconsin HIP Exchange page for SAMPRO. The toolkit is housed on a separate site to enable it to be updated frequently and to register users. Once you click on this View Toolkit button, you will be asked to create a username and password as well as enter your name and email address. In addition, we do collect some information about your position, your organization, as well as your location. This information will allow us to contact you with any news about updates or changes to the toolkit. Once you register and download the toolkit, you will have full access to all the resources created by the SAMPRO workforce or its partners. These resources include the asthma management plans shown earlier by Dr. Lemansky, as well as the asthma emergency plans we also talked about. In addition, we have included checklists, patient education handouts, and videos, as well as links for the environmental walkthrough program. As noted previously, you will have access to the electronic version of the asthma action plans, asthma emergency plans, and the school supplementary treatment form. These are available in English and in Spanish, as well as in modifiable PDFs, so that you can further customize the documents for your local needs. We kindly ask that if you do customize the asthma action plan, you retain the essential components of the plan as outlined in the white paper and in this webinar. A key feature of the toolkit is the use of checklists, which have been shown to be effective practice improvement tools. Checklists are available for the family, as shown here, the school nurse, as well as the provider, to ensure that each member 
of the circle of support is completing the necessary steps to ensure asthma care coordination among the circle of support. Component three involves establishing a comprehensive education program throughout the circle of support. A number of educational resources with live links as shown here are available within the toolkit. In addition, we do have tools such as the eSchool Care Program, which has offered its asthma education videos that are normally only accessible with a small fee. However, it is free for all Sampro Toolkit users. We also have included a Sampro slide set with and without narration, again available for download, to facilitate users educating themselves about Sampro as well as their local communities. Component four involves the reduction of environmental asthma triggers within schools. And within our toolkit, we have links to the EPA website as mentioned by Dr. Lemansky, as well as links to the indoor air quality mobile apps. In addition, as shown here, we have our environmental walkthrough checklist for school personnel to facilitate the reduction of triggers within schools. And so to summarize, the Sampro Toolkit is really made to help you implement Sampro in your local communities. It supports all four components of Sampro and is updated at least annually and with user feedback. I wanted to show you a little bit about what we do about your information that you enter in the registration, in the registration process. As we track program efficacy, we assemble data like you see in this slide here. This data gives us an idea of which groups of individuals, as well as which regions in the country, are most active with our SAMPRO initiative. This in turn influences our, deci our decisions about how to best reach our target audience in the future. However, your individual information is kept safe within our research uh, environment and is not sold or used for any other purpose. Again, we have been fortunate to collaborate with a number of highly respected organizations, including the Allergy and Asthma Network and the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology and the Quad AI, who have endorsed our SAMPRO program. And so to close, I would encourage you to get involved in SAMPRO to please visit our website and our toolkit. Don't be afraid to register and use the full gamut of resources that are available. And if you do have feedback or resources to contribute to our program, we do have an email address, sampro at quadai.org. We would like to thank our entire Sampro workforce for their tireless efforts to improve pediatric asthma care. And we look forward to continuing our work with this group as we move forward. And with that, Dr. Lemansky and I would like to thank the Asthma Allergy Network for the opportunity to discuss SAMPRO today. And we would also like to thank all of you for your participation in the webinar. And at this time, we can take any questions from the audience. Well, thank you both so much. This was so interesting. I had the pleasure of working on the work group that uh, worked on SAMPRO. And uh, what I appreciated the most about it was that uh, everybody really listened to each other and physicians were listening to nurses and nurses were listening to respiratory therapists and everybody and we had we had some uh, community individuals it was it was a really uh, synergistic uh, process and I think that's why it came up with something that was so universally accepted so I we have some questions and I will uh, pose them to Dr. Lemansky and Dr. Kakamanu. If you have a question, please go to your question box at this time, put that in and we'll get to as many as we can. So here's our first question. So how do you encourage primary care physicians and specialists to communicate with the school or school-based health center? Frequently our requests for asthma action plans are not honored by the primary health care provider or the specialist. Any advice you can provide would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, that's a great question, and that's one of the um, one of the issues that we um, felt was going to be very, very challenging. Um, when I took over as president, my initiative, at least at the outset, was to make sure that every child who had asthma and was in the schools 
had an asthma action plan in place. I thought that would be a slam dunk. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> and the reason it wasn't is because of all the different asthma action plans that are out there, um, how people communicate or don't communicate between the clinic office visit and getting the asthma action plan from the physician's office into the school situation or school setting. Um, the way it was working in Madison was is that we would do a written asthma action plan, we would give it to the parents, and then with the hope that the parents would take it to the schools, it would get in the hands of the school nurses, and everything would work out well. Um, and that didn't happen very often. In fact, we did a survey in the Madison Metropolitan School District and I think it was less than 5% of the, of the students who had asthma in the Madison Metropolitan School District had an asthma action plan that was readily accessible. That was really eye-opening for us. So Sujani and her group um, in, of uh, stakeholders, their task was to begin to create a uniform asthma action plan and to work out ways that this could be communicated effectively between the clinic and the school. And so the various ways this could be done is, again, the parent could take it individually. It could be faxed to the schools. Um, there'd have to be some way of us being able to know that it got there and got in the right hands. And of course, with the electronic medical record now, um, we have worked with EPIC because EPIC is, is within our surrounding community here in Verona. And they have been very, very helpful in um, uh, working with us and trying to create an asthma action plan within the electronic medical record that is very user friendly. And we're working on means to be able to communicate this information directly to, to the schools. Um, and Sujani is also working on some projects that will facilitate bi-directional communication between the schools using the um, electronic medical record for children with asthma and communicating more or less directly with the clinician and vice versa. Now that's, that's not part of SAMPRO, but that's part of what we envision as being future developments. So whoever asked this question, that is the crux of the problem, I think. And that's what we're trying to focus on to try to give everyone some help with this. So, Jenny, do you have anything else to say? Um, I think you brought up a really good point. You know, how do you change workflows and clinical practice to meet the needs, which is increasing um, care coordination for children uh, with schools? And that is going to require a coordinated approach. Um, here in Wisconsin, what we've done is, um, through the work of Gail Allen in our pediatric department, is really established some practice improvement modules and MOC activities, as well as department initiatives to improve um, the use of asthma action plans. And that's even before we got to the point where we needed to then send those asthma action plans to schools. So I think the first step, if, if you're looking at how do I start this and how do I you know, get asthma action plans to schools is to find champions in both areas, uh, the clinics and the hospitals, as well as, and the practices, as well as um, in the schools to really look at what each organization needs to do and um, how they need to change their workflows to make this happen. Those are great points. Uh, it, but there's a follow-up question that says, uh, from someone that said they were recommending that their own practitioners make their own plan and communicate that to the primary health care provider when, when there was no response received from the primary health care provider or the specialists or the parents. And the question is, is that appropriate practice? Well, um, that the answer to that question would depend, I think, and we talked about this in terms of the severity of the asthma of the, of the individual. There are many kids who, who probably only need to have some asthma medication before they do a certain activity in gym. And these kids are clearly gonna be in a different ball game than the kids who are on daily controller medication and have histories of having exacerbations and more severe disease. And that's why we thought it was extremely important to indicate this on the asthma action plan in terms of who the school nurse or school personnel should really keep an eye on to make sure that they're doing well um, on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Um, so in terms of being able to get the school to communicate back to the clinic and then the clinic to respond to that, that's really going to be on an individual basis. And hopefully programs like SAMPRO, um, once we get this out into the communities and people get more familiar with it and see all the different resources that are available, that um, communication problem hopefully will become much easier to solve. Oh, that's great. Um, next question. Is there any focus in SAMPRO on outdoor weather and environmental exposure triggers? Schools are often located near forest areas or near highways because of the low cost of property and poor air quality and high pollen levels have an impact on kids attending school. Well, there are there are some things in there in terms of the Environmental Protection Agency, those programs in terms of um, how to reduce outdoor and also the Wisconsin Asthma Coalition, that material that I shared with you on that slide, goes into a way of being able to go through the schools and actually uh, using a checklist to determine what's good and what's bad and what needs to be changed. Um, we also have some things in there in terms of um, um, educational material for bus drivers, in terms of bus exhaust, and just probably common sense things that people don't think about um, that uh, hopefully if we give this education and more of a standardized approach, we can open up some eyes and get people to realize that they need to make some changes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that leads into our next question. Uh, what are your thoughts and experiences with working with, sc this, with schools that don't have school nurses? How, could SAMPRO actually be implemented in those schools? The answer to that question is yes, um, but it would take, um, again, a champion, as um, Sujini mentioned before, within the schools um, to be able to deal with this and uh, have permission to deal with this from both the schools and the family standpoint. Um, the National Association of School Nurses is trying very hard and that was one of the recommendations that we had on one of our slides to really make a huge effort to try to um, get people to realize how important it is to have a school nurse available in as many schools as possible. Um, now I know financially that may not be possible, but it's, uh, it's a hope, it's a goal that we have and the National Association of School Nurses have. And, um, it's not just for asthma, that's obviously what we're interested in, but there are many kids who have other chronic uh, diseases and associated morbidity, for example, anaphylaxis, food allergies, diabetes, um, seizure disorders, et cetera, et cetera. And having a school nurse available can be absolutely critical in terms of uh, taking the best possible care of the kids while they're in school. Well, as a former school nurse myself, when people used to ask me, uh, well, what should we do if we don't have a school nurse? I said, well, the answer is completely simple. You simply need to get one. So uh, so I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that, Dr. Lemansky. So our next question is, it, does SAMPRA require funding to for implementation? And if so, have you found any sources of funding for implementing this? Well, that's a great question. We're, um, we're currently working on it. Um, there, there was a bill in Congress that had bipartisan support before the election that really covered all four components of SAMPRO, just word for word for word. And unfortunately, with after the election, this bill now is sort of stalled in Congress. And ironically, I just got an email uh, this afternoon from one of our uh, lobbyists who lobbied for us at the Academy, who was a real champion for this bill, saying that um, one of um, uh, the representatives who was very interested in sponsoring this bill has now resurrected it. Uh, so that's very fresh news to me, and um, it was very exciting news to me and hopefully we can keep it keep the bill moving uh, um, in the next six months and get it approved um, but with all programs like SAMPRO it's it's key to be able to with some way of continuing to um, supplement it to keep keep the programs going and that is that is a critical critical issue 
that we're currently uh, working with the academy um, and other organizations to um, work on different approaches to implementation and uh, dissemination. But sustainability is 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 key, obviously, um, and it's not an easy uh, easy thing to uh, be able to come up with a a simple solution for. Well, thank you. Uh, our next question is, have you heard of any challenges from school nurses regarding parental consent? Hmm. Um, school nurses, parental consent. You mean they, they don't want to give consent for the asthma action plan? I think it's probably just uh, getting getting the parent to sign off on things and and bring the plan and and that kind of thing. I think it comes oh. to what we were talking about before about communication and just right. to keep those those uh, bridges built and keep the lines of communication open. Right. Um, that that's the first challenge that we face in this circle of support is to get the clinician, well, first of all, to develop the asthma action plan, to get it into the hands of the parents, to get them to sign off on it. And in order to facilitate that, the clinician really um, has to take the time to explain the asthma action plan and the importance of the asthma action plan. And in doing so, I think that would greatly facilitate the parent being willing to sign off on this because this is really part of the health care of their child. And then the next step, of course, is getting the parent to have enough initiative to get this plan into the schools. And then once it gets into the school, the school personnel has to be able to have some standardized way of being able to deal with this um, in the school nurse's office and the child's personal file, uh, whatever. But these are all things that we discussed in the stakeholder meeting and are actually um, discussed at least in part within the uh, white paper that I showed you during my, my talk. Another person wants to know, uh, what's your thought about using peak flow meters at school? Oh, well, I um. There's another webinar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not an advocate of peak flow meters um, in children. I think that's a real black and white statement. For some kids, they can be very helpful, um, but they're not for everybody. And um, from some of the clinical research studies that we've done in, in asthma, peak flow meters over a time, about 25% of these break down and they're te technically totally inaccurate. So that's one problem with them. The other problem with them is they're extremely effort dependent. So if the kid wants to go home, they can just do a really poor peak flow effort and their peak flow is gonna be really low. The, School personnel will get, get worried and things will happen that probably should not have happened. But I, I can't say that they're not, um, that they're bad for everybody. There are certain, certain patients that I've taken care of over the years where the parents really feel that the peak flow helps them to be able to know when there's, uh, the child is coming down with something that could potentially lead to a more significant exacerbation. But on a routine basis, no. And that's one of the reasons we took peak flow out of the asthma action plan. Okay. Uh, next question is, is there an educational component regarding treatment options or medication management? Um, there's actually within, um, within the toolkit, um, there is a program that Michelle Claudier started um, called Easy Breathing. And she is in Connecticut and she was part of the uh, summit. And that particular program really is geared more toward um, educating the treating physician. There are components of it that also deal with the children, but it's, it's, it's more focused on delivering um, uh, treatment approaches on the part of the clinician. So whoever asked that question, if, if that would be helpful, I would encourage you to take a look at that program. Easy breathing. Well, that answered the next question too. 
Uh, somebody wanted to know how many states have stock albuterol. Is, I, that is something I can answer. Uh, I didn't know if you had an answer for that. Um, I can tell you um, the stock albuterol was put in the bill uh, regarding Sampro. And um, when this big issue uh, came forward about epinephrine, um, injectable epinephrine, the price of this going sky high, that the state legislators really were balking at putting albuterol in the bill because they were worried that that would somehow then increase the cost of that particular medication. So um, before the election, that piece of the legislation was taken out. Um, now, whether or not it'll be put back in again once the uh, Sampro bill begins to move forward, hopefully through the legislature, I can't say at this point. I, I can provide you with information that uh, on state level, there are approximately nine or 10 states that now have stock albuterol laws. And there are two states that actually have stock albuterol guidelines as well. So that is something you can be watching for. Uh, someone wanted to know if you could provide references for the evaluation of Iggy and the inhalers. So that information is available. That reference is in the toolkit. Um, it was, again, done by Kathleen Kelly Shannon, but just showed um, that even with a short amount of instructional time, you can improve um, knowledge of asthma um, for students in the program. And that was done in, in Madison. And that information, again, that reference is in our toolkit. Okay, one person offers a suggestion and says a school nurse could fax a blank asthma action plan to the child's primary health care provider and ask that it be completed. So there's one idea. That's, um, a great, that's a great suggestion. Okay, here's a question. How can a school nurse make the administrators understand that if a student's asthma is controlled, an asthmatic student can be in school? In our district, a mom has had her son out for over 80 days, and the school administrators are allowing this, even despite the student's allergist not being okay with this. Well, we don't have anything um, that deals with that directly in Sampro. Um, that's, that is a problem, obviously. There's, and, and all I can say is that somewhere along the way, the communication has broken down here. Um, and um, I'm not pointing fingers or anything, but it's just um, to have this school administration have that kind of a um, barrier for the kid to come into school. And I don't know, there's, there's probably pieces of information that we don't have, but I think it just boils down to communication and education. Okay, another question. Often HIPAA and FERPA have been a challenge for school-based health clinics to exchange information with school nurses. Do you have any strategies to overcome this? So one of the things we did with our asthma action plan is to put in wording, and that's on the bottom gray section, that um, accommodates HIPAA as well as FERPA privacy laws. And that was a specific concern of us, and it sounds like um, shared by uh, people in the audience, that when information is shared from the clinician to the school nurse and, and back from the school nurse to the clinician, that that information is protected by both the HIPAA and the FERPA privacy laws uh, to cover things such as if information is sent about attendance from the school nurse to the clinician and about their treatment and diagnosis from the clinician to the school nurse. So that um, we decided to cover very explicitly in the asthma action plan uh, throughout the SAMPRO program. Okay, uh, here, there's now we have a comment. Uh, here in Anderson, South Carolina, we've had some sex success sending hospital-based asthma educators to meet with the school nurse, the student, and the family for a session to go over the asthma action plan. So that's a very helpful idea as well. Uh, find out what, what uh, asthma clinics are at your local hospital. Uh, and then another, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I think um, it, it brings up a good point. Asthma educators, whether they're community health workers or um, traditional nurses or clinicians, can be really helpful in disseminating this program. Stan Seffler um, at, in Colorado has done some really great work showing how asthma educators recruited from the community can really improve asthma knowledge as well as actually asthma outcomes and school absenteeism from asthma. 
um, by coordinate, helping coordinating care for children. Yeah, I didn't mention this during my presentation, but I would just like to say that um, we, um, for people who already have an asthma management program for schools within their community and it's working well, um, we're not suggesting that SAMPRO replace it. Um, and we don't mean to imply that at all, but there clearly are many, many communities within our country where none of this is available. And we wanted to create a resource for people to either use where there isn't a, um, an established um, educational resource and circle of support, um, in addition to providing supplementary material where there may be something in the communities, but it's not as good as people would like it to be. And hopefully the sample program will allow them to improve it to a point where they really feel it's now working at its very best. Okay, I have a question from a parent. It says, I provide information and an asthma action plan for my child to the school. However, my child gets exposed to his triggers every year for the last six years. How can this information be protected like is done by HIPAA laws and have those plans followed? Well, um, that sounds to me more like a local, um, I don't know about legal, but um, a situation that uh, you may want to look into within your community and basically how to deal with this. If you're delivering information to the schools and um, they're not uh, communicating back or listening or acting upon it, then there must be some reason for that. And that, I just can't comment any more than, than that. I think you just need to get um, as much information as you can uh, and talk to people in school administration about how you may want to deal with that. Well, I think that speaks to the, the wonderful graphic you have, too, of the circle of support, is that the more that you can tie the individuals in that circle together around the student, I think the better outcomes there will be for that student as well. So I think building bridges and, and um, enhancing communication can go a long way. I agree. Okay. Well, we, we've got a few questions left, but I think we're just about at the end of our time. So uh, one other question was, is the PowerPoint available? And I would just like to encourage people, the biggest information in today's program is the SAMPRO toolkit. So I was going to ask uh, Dr. Kakamanu, will you tell everybody one more time how to get to the SAMPRO toolkit? So the SAMPRO toolkit, again, is available on the Quad AI website. You can access it via the link we showed um, during the webinar. You can also Google SAMPRO Quad AI, um, and it'll show up as, there as well. Um, and, and remind me your first question. The slides. The slides. There's a narrated slide set within the SAMPRO toolkit that's very similar to what we presented today. There's one version that's narrated. Uh, to facilitate uh, individuals educating themselves. And there's a identical version without the narration in case individuals wanna use that same slide set to educate their community. Um, so I, I invite you to take a look at that within our toolkit. And I'd like to, just in closing here, I'd like to do a commercial. Um, Sujini and I, um, along with some of our colleagues from the National Association of School Nurses, along with our colleagues here at the University of Wisconsin, have now made a video um, regarding SAMPRO. It's very short, um, but we hope it'll be very useful in the communities to be able to get the word out. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll have this out and available in about three to four weeks. And I think we can post this on the website for people to be able to use. But We've, we've completed it, we've, um, we've vetted it. It still has to be approved by the Academy, but I don't think that'll be an issue. But we're, Sujin and I are really excited about this. Um, this was Sujini's idea and I it was, a, it was a great one. So look forward to that. And this webinar will be available. It'll be recorded and be on our website so that if anyone needs to uh, check some information that they wanted to confirm, that will be available to you as well. So I would like to thank our, our uh, colleagues today, Dr. Lemansky and Dr. Kakamanu. This program should really benefit our school-aged children and youth. And I would like to encourage all school nurses to implement the, the components of SAMPRO in your school. So I'd like you to please be sure and register and join us for the remaining webinars in our series. 
Uh, our next webinar will be held on May 24th at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be looking at insect sting allergies with Dr. Jim Tracy. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for education in the horizontal navigational bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. That's where you can also view all our archived webinars uh, at, at the same time. The Allergy and Asthma Network is offering a new resource to you this year. We have a three to five minute video post of our very popular Ask the Allergist series. On our website under News and Views, you can click on Ask the Allergy Allergist. This month's post features Dr. Katya speaking on evaluating the role of biologics in asthma management. So we thank you for joining us today. The mission of the Allergy and Asthma Network is to end the need for suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Please visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma, and also access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners at the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you for joining us today.